Hey, it's your friends from the public library. It's Molly and Jan and I'm Sue. And look, we've even got the dog looking and the moose. They're watching us because we're gonna have an awesome book talk today. We're gonna to talk about eight books. Let me share my screen so that you guys can get to all see the beautiful covers of these books. There we go. There we go. So this year, our theme for the whole year is Tales and Tales. So we're mostly going to be talking about animals and all the different kinds of stories. Uh, today's books maybe have some animals in them, but maybe they don't. Um, once again, this comes to you from the Wapaka Public Library in beautiful downtown Wapaka, right on Main Street. And uh, if you are interested in any of the titles that we're talking about here, uh, all you really need to do is let your teacher or your librarian know you'd like a copy and we're going to make some copies available uh, at your school library and then you can check them out through your school. So we're going to talk about eight books. We're going to take turns talking about them. Team, are you ready? Ready. Ready. Uh, thumbs up. Here we go. Oh, and I've got the first one. So ACT is book number three in the Click series by Kayla um, Miller. It is a graphic novel, but it is one of the most graphic, it is the graphic novel that I think depicts what real life for a uh, nine to 12 year old is really, really like. And I really like that Olive is uh, back in this story with a school story that she kind of sits a little rough in her stomach. She is um, uh, excited to be starting sixth grade. She's excited about all the new experiences and especially in sixth grade, they take this really awesome field trip to the city. But what she discovers on this field trip is not all the kids in her class get to go. Evidently, she finds out the very next day that those kids that didn't go didn't go because their parents couldn't afford to pay for her to for them to go on the trip and she just doesn't think this is fair have you guys ever thought that something wasn't fair there's some injustice that you want to write well this is where olive is she thinks field trips should be for everyone and so she goes about trying to find the appropriate ways to get the injustice changed so that everybody gets to go on the field trip and so she goes to her teacher and the teacher says, well, you know, field trips are kind of expensive. We really can't afford to let everybody go if they, you know, if they can't pay. Well, she hits a roadblock there. So she does uh, have an opportunity to talk to her favorite aunt who gives her some great suggestions on what she can do to be part of the solution. And uh, Olive is prepared to do whatever it takes to have her voice heard. And even if it means running against two of her best friends for student council. And so we'll see uh, in ACT if you uh, think she's going to win and whether or not she can change the school's policy on who can go on field trips. And you know, sometimes um, the only person who can make a difference is you. And I think this is one of the strong messages in ACT. I also like the fact that Kayla Miller in the back of the book has a section called Odds and Ends. And in Odds and Ends, she gives a recipe for some really awesome chocolate chip cookies. She also talks about peaceful protests of the past. So other people who have felt a little bit that they could help with the injustice in the world. And she also has some suggested readings and some tips on how to draw graphic novels. So if you are an artist and you like reading and, and appreciating um, uh, graphic novels, you're going to get some drawing tips from Kayla Miller herself. This is act number three of the uh, Click series by Kayla Miller. The first book I'm going to talk about is A Home for Goddesses and Dogs. So our main character, Lydia, um, her mom just passed away from a weak heart. And this means that life is gonna change completely, completely for Lydia. She used to live in the city with her mom. Um, she did homeschooling because they knew mom didn't have long. Um, so she was home with mom as much as possible. Well, now 
She's living in the country with her aunts, the older gentleman they're taking care of, and this old lazy greyhound that the aunts had adopted. Well, um, and now she's got going to public school and has to make new friends and just kind of get used to this new life. Her aunts are pretty good about respecting the fact that she needs to grieve and adjust to her new life. But on the second day living with them, they also decide to go to an adoption event and adopt another dog. So they go to the adoption event and one of her aunts falls in love with this big, awkward, just weird yellow dog that um, just doesn't, doesn't seem comfortable in its own skin. And Lydia's never been a dog person, but you know she doesn't really have a say she doesn't feel like in this house. So she lets them adopt this, this dog and it's way different than the lazy old greyhound they were living with. So now she has to get used to living with this dog that doesn't even really know how to be a dog. I mean, it, it doesn't even know to go outside to go to the bathroom half the time. So she's got all these new things coming together and she finds some unique ways to kind of to learn to live in her new reality that include a hole in the wall, um, the special goddess collages she made with her mom before she passed away, this, this strange new dog in their house and some new friends that she makes along the way dogs. We love dogs. Okay, the next book is Guest. And as you can tell by the cover, it's a spooky, scary type of story. Um, and it incorporates a little bit of an Irish folktale about the kind folk and kind meaning K-I-N-D-E. And these are sprites and fairies that are not kind. They're mean, mischievous, vengeful, dangerous creatures. And it was believed that if you said out loud while looking at a baby that, oh, he's so sweet, he's so kind, he's so, he's such a good baby, that the fairies would come because they're always watching you. And they would snatch that human baby away and replace it with a kind folk fairy baby. And those babies were nasty. Just nasty. Well, Molly is out in the garden doing um, family chores, and she's kind of resentful of the fact that she's got to do these chores and watch after her infant brother, Thomas. And she's looking at Thomas, and Thomas, the sweet baby that he is, takes this locket off of his neck and hands it to Molly. And Molly looks at him, and she's always wanted that necklace anyway. And she says, oh, Thomas, you are so sweet for giving me this. You're so generous. And she puts it around her neck and then goes off and finishes her gardening. She comes back where Thomas was and Thomas is screaming and kicking and biting. And he's just not the usual sweet baby. She runs into the house, shows it, shows the baby to mom. Mom sends for the healer and the healer comes and says, look closely. That's not your baby. That's a fairy baby. But if you keep very good care of this fairy baby, the fairies might come back and give you your Thomas back. Well, in caring for this screaming, biting, kicking child, the family kind of falls apart. Dad leaves the house, leaves the village, mom's health deteriorates. So Molly decides she's got to take this baby, which she calls guest, back to the fairies and hopefully will get their baby back. She runs, she goes into the Mirkwood where the fairies live and she runs into this creature called Mad Dog who knows a little too much about the kind folk. She also runs into a puka, Will of the Wisp, um, a wolf, and some nasty, nasty, nasty fairies. And also, Guest has a few surprises for her. So you're going to have to read the Guest in order to find out. I might be too afraid. Well, and I do think that Mary Downing Hahn, the author of this book, is known for her uh, tales that are uh, a little supernatural and yeah. spooky, right? So if you like, right. speaking, put that author on your list, Mary Downing Hahn. Well, <clears throat> this is not spooky. This is a book called Ways to Make Sunshine. Doesn't even sound spooky, does it? 
Uh, it's going to be a new series. So if you are a series reader, pay attention to this. It's written by Renee Watson. And Renee Watson writes about Portland, Oregon. And teachers that are listening, you're going to love this because this is an updated uh, Ramona style character. Um, and very exciting because Ramona was set in Portland, Oregon too. But uh, you know, in the, the opening of this story, uh, sets the tone because in uh, Ryan Hart's family, her name is Ryan, uh, one day mom serves ice cream before dinner. If that Woo! happens in your house, you know something bad is coming right after that, right? No one ever gives you ice cream before dinner. So <laughs> not always something to celebrate when that happens. And this is an obvious ploy on the part of Ryan's parents and she doesn't trust it right away. And she was right because the next thing they know, they're moving out of their house into a smaller house. They have to sell their second car. Things are rough. Brian's dad has lost his job and been without a job for a while. And they just have to make ends meet. And to do that, sometimes you have to sacrifice, right? And But now he gets another job. And he, but he's working the night shift. So that means Ryan and her brother have to be quiet because dad's sleeping and there's all these challenges. Money is tight. Ryan loves to cook. And sometimes when she doesn't make things right, they have to throw away what she makes. And now they just can't afford to throw away food. So she has to be really not as experimental in her cooking as, as she would like. Um, but, you know, one thing about Ryan is that sh she likes to make good out of a bad situation. She can always look on the bright side. She can always see that the glass is half full. Even when her brother is a big pain in the neck, oh, <laughs> she can she can turn it around and life life works pretty good. Um, but you know what? Parent, her parents are understanding that she's having some difficulty in this new world that she can't have her friends over. The house is too small. They have to be quiet. Um, she gets invited to a birthday party uh, from an old friend from the old neighborhood and she doesn't know any of the other kids that are there. And, and so she, she has to turn it around and make uh, something good. Her name is Ryan, which her parents tell her means king. And so she sees herself as having to live up to that name as a, being a leader. She tries to be a good kid, but sometimes it's pretty tricky. And sometimes even though you know the right thing to do, sometimes you make a mistake and you slip, right? Um, so I'm not gonna forget Ryan. Ryan is one of these characters that you are gonna remember for a long, long time. She's the friend that you will always get along with. The one who is never dull. You'll never be bored when Ryan's around. And the one that's always got something going on in that head of hers, even when she's dead silent, she's thinking about what's gonna happen next. So <laughs> it's a good series to, to start up on. Renee Watson promises to make more Ryan Hart books and I can't wait to read them. Ways to Make Sunshine. So my next book, actually the, the 35th anniversary just came around that this book is based off of. It was from a historic space shuttle mission. And we get to follow the adventures of these three siblings as they live through this historic event. Um, the Nelson Thomas family is three kids. They're um, all in the same grade and things are kind of chaotic at home at times. Both parents are working, their kitchen table is just overflowing with stuff all the time. And uh, they're all in school and the, they start a project based off this space shuttle mission that's coming up. So Cash is the oldest. He actually is repeating the grade and uh, he really struggles with school and he's struggling again. And he's been able to keep his grades up to stay on the basketball team. But if you notice in the picture, shortly after the book starts, he breaks his arm and his motivation to stay on the basketball team is gone. So Cash, you know, really doesn't care about the space shuttle mission go coming up, but he really is struggling to kind of find his place and discover what he's good at. And he, that's, he just doesn't really think he's good at anything. Well, Bird is one of the twins and Bird is just smart as can be. She loves science, she loves engineering. Her free time is spent taking things apart and drawing diagrams and 
And she just, she is all about learning. So this space shuttle mission really struck a chord with her and she is just excited about this project in school and, it, and practically transports to, in her mind, to that mission every time they work on it in school. So she just can't wait to learn more about this. And then Fitch is the other twin and his name comes from when they were very little bird at one point said something about he was pitching a fit a pitch or he messed up saying pitching a fit and it stuck because that is Fitch. He is just got a short temper. Things have to be one certain way. And so he just, he's kind of known for his temper. And um, he also loves video games. It's about the only thing he's passionate about. So he spends most of his time at the arcade. Well, one day while they're working on the project, there's um, this girl that he's really struggled just to be kind to. He, he, he knows he needs to be nice, but she just kind of grates on him and refuses to call him by his nickname. And he at one point blows up, says some really unkind things and gets suspended from school. So all these kids that all of the, live under the same house are so completely different from one another, but they're living through the same experience, the same class project from different class periods. And uh, we get to see how they live through this event and kind of find their place with all of this going on in their lives. I love space stories. I love them. Oh, <laughs> give the dog a hand. Yet. I have yet to find a Gordon Corman book that I haven't enjoyed. And this is another one called Notorious. And um, after getting a diagnosis of tuberculosis, Keenan was sent to live with his dad on this island that sits smack dab between Canada and the United States. And while he's resting in the backyard, um, Zara Beth shows up and she's got her little dog, uh, Barney. And he soon discovers that Zarabeth is completely obsessed with the history of this island as being the hideout for criminals that were running away from the law. And they not only would hide from the law, but they'd bury their treasures. She's also obsessed with her first dog, Barney, who was known to be the terror of the island. And if you look closely at that, um, picture of the cover of the book. You see that shadowy figure back there? Well, that's her first dog, Barney, who, who's huge. I'll just read you. Um, nobody, nobody liked this dog. Wait, wait, wait. What? Don't listen. Don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Zarabeth then shows a video to um, Keenan about, about Barney number one. And this is um, what she says, you never met Barney, she insists mournfully. We couldn't keep him tied up. He always got away. We had a six foot fence, he jumped it. And once he was loose, he roamed all over the island, digging, barking, pooping, wherever he pleased. He growled at people and even bit them if he didn't, if they didn't bark, if they didn't back off. He broke into the supermarket, ransacked the food. He howled so loud you could hear it on the mainland and in both countries. He was part Mastiff, so he was gigantic. He was part Rottweiler, so nothing scared him. And he was part Newfoundland. So if the cops came after him, he just jumped into the river and paddled away. He hated other dogs. He didn't have a single friend except me. I didn't hate Barney. I loved him. Someone had to. <laughs> so she's also obsessed with the fact that she's sure that uh, Barney, number one, did not die of natural causes. So she's out to um, do two things, find treasure and um, find the person that um, did harm to Barney, number one. Well, as Keenan is healing, he's also finding new friends. And as he hangs out with these new friends, he's starting to see Zara Beth in a little different um, manner. He's all these other people that live on the island think that Zara Beth is a little too crazy and um, telling tall tales. And, um, but Keenan comes across something that convinces him 
that Zara Beth is actually the only person that knows the truth about the island and Barney number one. And just as he's about to try to convince Zara Beth that he's back on her side and he wants to help her, that's all he wants to do, someone starts following them. So you're going to have to read the story to find out what's going on there. It's hilarious, but at the same time, it's a great mystery and a detective story. No one does it better than Gordon Corman, right? That's right. He's pretty great. Well, this book is uh, written by the famous author Lois Lowry. You might know her from um, uh, other books like The Giver and um, Oh, help me out, Dan. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, blue. It's got blue in the stars. Car. Number of the stars. Number of the stars. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, this is a historical uh, fiction. Actually, we have it in nonfiction because it's written in poetry. As you can see there, there's um, it's it's illustrated, but it's also written in poetry. Uh, Lois Lowry grew up as a child and lived in many, many places. And one of the places she lived in, in a as, as a child was Pearl Harbor. And you guys know that Pearl Harbor was one of the places that was attacked by the Japanese. It's a famous battle site um, and lots of American soldiers lost their lives uh, at Pearl Harbor. And another place she lived when she was 11, she moved to Japan. And in Japan, she was uh, able to meet and talk to people who survived the terrible bombing that Americans did in Hiroshima. And so um, this is a book that is very interesting because it tells stories of the people who um, were part participating in the war on, on opposite sides. But what I really appreciate about the story is that it has this personal tale because um, this whole idea of writing this book started many, many years ago when uh, Lois Lowry was watching old family videos of her as a very young child on the beaches of, of uh, Pearl Harbor, of, of Hawaii. And in the very background, in the faint horizon, you could see, just like in this cover of the book here, you can see the battleship, the USS Arizona. And that is one of the ships that went down on that fateful day. Um, and uh, she realizes that there was this connection between her and all the people that were lost on that ship. Um, she also, um, uh, tell stories about the sailors. And um, I want to read one of them because it has a Wisconsin connection. Uh, it's the story of Leo Amundsen. Uh, Leo was just 17. He'd enlisted in July. The U.S. Marines, he must have been proud. And his folks too, Scandinavian stock, immigrants to Wisconsin like my own grandparents. Leo was from La Crosse. My father was born there. My nanny had come from La Crosse by train. Had she known Leo's parents? Had she nodded to Mrs. Amundsen on the street? Had she said, good morning, I hear your boy's a Marine now. Nani and I played on the beach in the sunshine on the horizon, the boy from the cross, just 17, service number 309872 was on the ship. We never knew. So what Lois Lowry does in this, in this short, short, it's very thin book, she connects stories of Japanese people to American people because I think that's one of her goals with this book is that um, we have to find ways for our lives to intersect and find out why when they fail to intersect what we can do to make them intersect more because the to honor the past um, we have to make promises to our fellow human beings that we will work and work for a better world and a more peaceful world in the future. So Lois Lowry, um, wonderful story of both Pearl Harbor and Japan in the 1940s. A Drop of Hope. There are three friends that live in a town that is um, experiencing hard times. A lot of people are having stress 
um, losing jobs. It's, it's not a good time for the people in this town. Well, these three friends at one point um, find themselves in this underground cave. And they notice that there are coins all around the floor of this cave. And they all of a sudden realize, oh, this is the bottom of the legendary Tompkins wishing well. And people are still making wishes into this wishing well. And so these kids are privy or they hear the wishes of these uh, citizens of this town. And some of them are really personal and heartbreaking wishes, but um, they can't decide what to do. Do we get involved? Do we just, you know, we shouldn't even be listening to these wishes. Well, Ernest, one of the friends, made a promise to his grandfather right before his grandfather died that upon his death, Ernest would clean out his attic. And so while they're making this decision about these wishes that they're hearing, um, Ernest finds these very strange things in his grandfather's attic. And they have a connection to some of these wishes, but also um, they, uh, the wishing well itself finds a very dramatic way of completely keeping the wishes that these people have made into this well secret. So you have to um, read the book. Um, it's told through multiple voices. So you're hearing some of the people that are making the wishes. You're hearing Ernest and his two friends, um, how they're telling the story. So you're getting all these different perspectives or, or views of what's going on. And you kind of have to piece them together in order to find the total story. It's kind of like a big jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together to find the complete story, a drop of hope. Ooh, I make wishes all the time when I see a wishing well. <laughs> I do. Where, do you, I, where have you found uh, a wishing well? Well, I haven't seen one recently, but okay. <laughs> anywhere. But when I do see one, I usually throw a coin in and I make a wish. Don't That's you? That's true. Yep. Yeah, I just hey. thought maybe that Wapaka had one that I didn't know about. Well, maybe we'll put one in. <laughs> well that's our book talk eight books i hope that there's at least one that you like and uh, that you can check out from your school library we are still providing curbside service six days a week um all all the while we're open so um, if you want to get something from the public library all you have to do is either give us a call or fill out the form that's on our website and we'll be happy to put together a book pack for you uh, to pick up curbside so until we meet again, friends, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. -bye.